Yes, yes, it's red. That means it's... Okay. All right. No, no, no. No, I'm fine. I'm fine. Fine. Yes, no, no, no. I, I won't call again, Joffrey. Yes. Yes, goodbye. Good afternoon and welcome back to Miss P Presents with me, Miss P. Last week we were discussing my top 10 novels of the 1950s and this week we are moving on to my top 10 novels of the 1960s. Now unfortunately Joffrey isn't here this week as he's had to attend upon an invalid aunt. I have every hope that he'll be back soon but just in case he's not, please do bear with me. Well, without further ado, Grab yourself a drink and let's get talking. First up on the list we have Wide Sargasso Sea by Jean Rhys, published in 1966. This is an absolutely brilliant book that uses its female protagonists to mount a critique of the masculinist rationality which dictates female subordination and male superiority. The story takes its protagonist from Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre known in that novel as Bertha, Mr Rochester's first wife. In Wide Sargasso Sea, she is Antoinette Cosway, a Crail heiress who, after a short acquaintance, marries an unnamed Englishman. Their relationship lacks both love and understanding, and quickly turns into something hostile. Antoinette's new husband is led to believe that there is madness in her family, and thereafter believes that he sees signs of insanity in her. So she did go mad. They told me she was ill. That she'd gone to the country. He makes the decision to take her back to England, where he locks her away at his estate, Thornfield Hall, with just one servant, Grace Poole, to attend on her. Wide Sargasso Sea is a postmodern masterpiece, full of atmosphere, drama, psychology, darkness, and imagination. Next up on the list, we have The Collector by John Fowles, published in 1963. I absolutely love this book. Frederick Clegg, um, the protagonist, is a lonely, uneducated clerk who collects butterflies and is obsessed with a beautiful art student named Miranda. When Clegg suddenly comes into some money, he buys a house in rural Sussex and after much planning, very calmly abducts Miranda. Hello, Joffrey. Joffrey, it's me. Very, very quick, very quick, I promise. Um, it's just about the coffee. Yes, well, it's just, it doesn't taste like it normally does. I just wondered if there was any way you could hop back and no, 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 of course not. No, no, I know. All right, Joffrey. All right. Stay in touch. Goodbye. <sighs> Structurally, it's made up of two elements. Clegg's account of his burgeoning obsession and subsequent abduction of Miranda, and Miranda's own diary, in which she talks of her current captivity and memories of her old life. The dynamic between the two is absolutely fascinating, as Miranda attempts to understand Clegg in an attempt to gain her freedom. It's creepy, sinister and totally thrilling, with Miranda's voice providing some highly engaging moments of light relief, as she reminisces about freedom, college friends and an older artist who appealed greatly to her romantic sensibilities. Next up we have A Single Man by Christopher Isherwood published in 1964. This is a beautiful book about George Falconer, a middle-aged Englishman and professor who was left heartbroken following the unexpected death of his partner Jim. We are shown one day in George's life as he struggles with grief and his own presence. Living in Santa Monica, the day passes in a fairly routine manner. He teaches a class, has an argument with his neighbours, 
visits an old friend, goes to the gym, the supermarket, and finally back home again. For the first time in my life, I can't see my future. Every day goes by in the haze. Isherwood conveys George's predicament as a gay widower at a time when homosexuality was illegal so brilliantly. We witness his struggle to come to terms with the tragedy of Jim's death, whilst at the same time still feeling a great desire to live his own life. It's a tender, heartfelt book that's rich in feeling, emotion and texture. Next up we have To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee, published in 1960. This is a much-loved, much-celebrated classic that recently caused debate after it was banned from a school in Edinburgh. The novel was described by some staff members as being problematic and dated because its lead characters were not people of colour. Told from the point of view of a child, Scout Finch, it follows events in the small Alabama town of Maycomb in the 1930s. Scout's father Atticus is a lawyer who takes on the case of Tom Robinson, a black man accused of raping a white girl. It's a powerful portrait of a town steeped in racism, brutality and hypocrisy. It's a brilliant read. Miss Jean Louise? Miss Jean Louise, stand up. Your father's passed me. Next up we have The Prime of Miss Jean Brady by Muriel Spark, published in 1961. I read through this novel with a permanent smile on my face, for has there ever been a more beguiling character than Miss Jean Brody? If you've ever had an adult or a teacher in your life who placed importance on teaching you things that made you feel alive, as opposed to just teaching you to jump through hoops, tick boxes, and to fit in with society, then this book will give you a feeling of familiar joy. Placing particular emphasis on how to care for the skin and hands, summer holidays of bygone years, Italian art and love affairs, Miss Brodie cultivates a sense of superiority in her girls, who she believes will become the creme de la creme. You girls are my life now. Soon you will graduate and I will no longer teach you, but you will always be Brodie girls. Unfortunately, Miss Brodie's motives are not selfless, but rather born from a desire to control and manipulate the lives of her young pupils. It's a fascinating read that's full of wit and humour. Next up we have The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath, published in 1963 under a pseudonym. This is one of those books that I wish I had discovered when I was a teenager. The narrative voice grabs your attention right from the very first sentence and holds you right to the very last. That voice belongs to Esther Greenwood, a young fashion magazine intern in New York City in the 1950s. It's an electric novel that reeks of death and sex and is honestly one of the most engaging books I've ever read. Esther talks about her ambitions, her moods, her desires, her experiences, and the ghosts that haunt her with such honesty that it almost makes you breathless. The novel chronicles her descent into depression, taking us from manuscripts, cocktails, and sleazy men to doctors, hospital wards, and suicide attempts. It's really powerful stuff. Hello, Joffrey. It's me. No, 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 everything's fine. Everything's fine. I, I just wanted to ask about luncheon. You've ordered it. And will it be arriving at 12.30? Very good. Will I need to pay the gentleman? You've ordered it. Yes, yes, no, no, I know, I know you said this morning. I just, just thought I'd call in and check. All right. No, Joffrey, it's fine. I, I won't need to call again. Everything's fine. Yes, yes, getting on fine. Yes, of course, you're very busy. You must go. I, um, I do hope she's feeling better. Is she feeling better? 
So you might be back in an hour? No, far too soon to say. Yes, I understand. All right, Joffrey, I'll speak to you later. No, no, I won't. I want you to call you again. Goodbye. Next up, we have Revolutionary Road by Richard Yates, published in 1961. This is a classic American novel. The central characters are Frank and April Wheeler, a bright but bored young couple who believe that they were destined for a life more extraordinary than the one they're living. The dialogue in particular is absolutely superb. And on top of this, Yeats allows us to hear the unsaid, imagined dialogue that shows the discord between fantasy and reality, what it was and what it might have been. In Revolutionary Road, Yeats creates a powerful, vivid, unsettling portrait of a once hopeful couple's marriage in decline. Told mainly from the point of view of Frank, we witness how often he deceives himself and are made to feel a mixture of empathy and distaste towards him. It strikes me that there's a considerable amount of bullshit going on here, and there's just a few things that I'd like to clear up, all right? Number one, it's not my fault that the play was lousy, okay? Number two, it sure as hell isn't my fault that you didn't turn out to be an actress. And the sooner you get over that little piece of soap opera, the better off we're both going to be. Number three, I don't happen to fit the role of dumb, insensitive suburban husband. You've been trying to lay that crap on me ever since you moved out here, and I'm damned if I'll wear it. Number four, April. Almost all of the characters in this novel are engaged in some form of self-denial. Even their address, Revolutionary Road, which is described as a whole bunch of cute little winding roads and cute little houses painted white and pink and baby blue, is exactly what it says it's not. Common, conformist, banal, unimaginative, unrevolutionary. Next up we have The Master and Margarita by Mikhail Bulgakov, published in 1966. Written in the Soviet Union between 1928 and 1940 under Stalin's regime and considered highly subversive at the time, the manuscript wasn't published until after Bulgakov's death, and even then it was heavily censored. The novel is made up of two intertwining narratives. In one, the devil and his supernatural retinue visit Moscow to wreak havoc, leaving untouched only two people, the master, a writer, and Margarita, the woman he loves. In the other, we witness Pilate's trial of Yeshua HaNosri, Jesus of Nazareth. It's an unforgettable, fantastical tale that is full of mystery, drama, humour and depth. Next up, we have The French Lieutenant's Woman, published in 1969, and The Majors, published in 1965, both by John Fowles. Now, just to be clear, I'm not picking 11 titles for my top 10 this week. Or maybe I am. Joffrey's not here to stop me this week, so... But honestly, I just couldn't decide which of these I preferred, and I would love to have your opinion on what your favourite John Fowles novel is. One of his great talents is the ability to write in such varying styles. The Collector, The French Lieutenant's Woman, and The Magus are three vastly different novels, each with their own unique sense of time and place. The Magus I read as a teenager and was shocked by it. I'd be interested to read it again now, as although I don't remember enjoying it a great deal, it is a novel that has stayed with me, as I'd never read anything like it before and still haven't since. The French Lieutenant's Woman is a rich, passionately written novel about a respectable, engaged man and a fallen woman. Both are masterfully written, unusual, accomplished works of fiction that, in my opinion, deserve to be read for that reason alone. Last on the list, we have The Expendable Man by Dorothy B. Hughes, published in 1963. This book blew me away. 
I was hooked right from the very first page. Hughes is so good at creating atmosphere. She'll have you engrossed right from the start and you'll be holding your breath right till the very end. It tells the story of Dr. Hugh Densmore, an intern who is driving to Phoenix for a family wedding when he makes the decision to pick up a hitchhiker. I honestly don't feel like I can say anything more without giving the plot away, but believe me when I say that this is an exceptionally good novel. If there's going to be just one that you decide to read from this list, let it be this one. That was Miss P's top 10 novels of the 1960s. Join me next time when I'll be discussing my top 10 novels of the 1970s. You won't want to miss it. Joffrey, are you coming back? Oh, delivery? Yes, I'm just coming down. Just a minute, thank you. Thank you so much for watching my channel. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe so you can keep up to date with all things Miss P Presents. See you next time.